As part of the state budget adopted in the spring, state lawmakers and Governor Kathy Hochul agreed on the creation of a Climate Action Fund, which will invest revenues generated as a result of regulations stemming from the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, including a program state regulators are designing now, which would charge large polluters for their emissions and put a gradually shrinking cap on pollution levels. For more on the new fund, including additional specifics that are needed for implementation, as well as other environmental priorities that may be addressed before the end of the legislative session, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Deborah Glick, a Manhattan Democrat. Welcome back to the show, Assemblymember. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you today. It's our pleasure to have you. So what sort of parameters were laid out in the budget for the Climate Action Fund? What actual details are in there in law right now? First of all, people should know that the regulations that will generate the revenues Mm -hmm. will be written over the next several months by the Department of Environmental Conservation, probably in consultation with NYSERDA, which does um, our energy policy. And once those regulations figure out what the fees would be based on which entities need to pay into the fund. And of course, our hope is that over time, they reduce their emissions. I mean, the whole point is to incentivize the reduction of emissions. That's the goal. That's what our climate leadership and protection are about. And those revenues will then be used to provide rebates to members of the community in the state to reduce the cost that they might incur. There will be some support for smaller industrial enterprises that don't have the resources to assist them in reducing their emissions. And then it will help to provide support for the state to undertake projects to clean the air, clean the water, etc., So right now, though, does the budget language include, say, what percentage of revenues are going to go towards rebates for, say, small businesses and consumers? Uh, Or or is that more left to be worked out as part of future regulations? Those are actually in there. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I think it's 33% for rebates to individuals. Mm -hmm. There's 3% for smaller industrial enterprises. And then the balance is for the state to utilize in uh, ensuring that the goals of our climate leadership program are able to be enacted. And are there strings attached to those investments as part of this budget as well? There are delineations of the kinds of activities. Again, clean water, clean air. There are additional supports for ensuring that local communities, local governments, Mm -hmm. can engage in the same kinds of improvements in their localities. Now, I will say that we also, the budget was, had a lot about environment. The Environmental Protection Fund was $400 million. Those resources go into a wide range of capital programs uh, from assisting the Catskills and the Adirondacks in purchasing open space and at the same time improving their uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, One of the things that was bad about the pandemic was that people were isolated. The good thing was that people were upset about being isolated and so they got out into nature uh, where they felt safer. But it changed the numbers of people who wound up utilizing and, and discovering the Catskills, the Adirondacks, and places that had 10,000 people visit in the course of a year were seeing 30,000 people almost overnight. We also have a lot of localities that need water infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure improvement. Uh, there's Clean Water Act uh, money, um, Water Infrastructure Act money. And we also have the Bond Act. And that there are resources that are beginning to be uh, added to investments by the state that are being augmented by 
the Bond Act dollars. People should know. They voted. New Yorkers across New York, every demographic, supported the Environmental Bond Act. And those resources are now starting to be distributed so that smaller communities that don't have the, um, unlike some of the municipalities that might have uh, a department of public works that's pretty robust, that can fill out a grant proposal, there are resources available to those localities so that they can improve their wastewater, they can improve their drinking water. Um, and so there's a great deal that came out of this budget. Wait, speaking of resources, when you think about the amount that the Climate Action Fund will have to distribute in the future, should we be thinking about hundreds of millions like the money for clean water and the EPF? Or should we be thinking billions like the Environmental Bond Act, which is $4 billion? Um, well, uh, or TBD. <laughs> I think that it will depend on the way in which the regulations are written. I think we're thinking that it will be at least in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars on an annual basis, but it could be larger than that. Uh, I know that there are some folks who have proposed other measures that would essentially tax polluters in a particular way, and we've said, I've said to them, let's see what regulations come out of this approach and then decide whether we need to do additional actions in order to have the resources to move as aggressively and as quickly as possible. The thing about, you know, uh, this is my first session as chair of uh, the Environmental Conservation Committee, and it is a very wide portfolio. So we are focused on waste reduction in uh, packaging, we are looking at these investments in reducing emissions. Other committees are looking at uh, aggressively increasing renewable energy, again, to reduce emissions. And I think that New York State is going to be a, a leader ac across all of these areas to set a standard that we know we need to reach because there's no planet B. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Deborah Glick, a Manhattan Democrat. So when you talk about the scope of the problem and the scope of the response that we need to have from the state, do you feel confident in the ability of the state DEC and NYSERDA to craft a cap-and-invest program that is up to the current crisis? Because I know some environmentalists were a little concerned about the language that was emerging from the Hochul administration on how they wanted to treat things like methane moving forward. So do you feel like they are in a position and mindset to aggressively approach this? Or does the legislature need to step in and put more guardrails on what a cap and invest program should look like? Well, first, I will say that the CLCPA was quite clear on the standard that we're going to use in New York State that is a 20-year methane approach mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some other places that may be looking at uh, a 100-year carbon dioxide standard measure. And the reason is that methane traps heat many, many, many times more than carbon dioxide. It may not persist as long as CO2, but if you're going to reduce our heat impact, you have to reduce methane. And one of the things that we will be discussing after the session with the department is how quickly and aggressively they're going back and looking at unused mines and, and wells that are belching methane. It's kind of low-hanging fruit. We have to make certain that there are no uncapped methane wells in the state of New York, and we haven't moved as aggressively as we need to. Now, the budget did include over 200 new lines for DEC, so I'm confident that they can staff up and that they can actually fill the positions that are needed 
to address all of the climate policy initiatives that we are pursuing. But there's always oversight, and we intend to hold uh, any hearings that might be necessary to ensure that we're moving along. Uh, I think there were some concerns about the way in which uh, they were handling major emitters, and I think we made our points uh, in the budget discussions. So I'm hopeful that we will see uh, fairly tight regulations, and the incentive will be it'll be cheaper for emitters to clean up their act than it will be to pay the fees that will be associated with those bad acts. Well, finally, where do things stand now with just a, a few days left in the legislative session on this goal of reducing waste from packaging and shifting the onus of recycling onto uh, manufacturers? We are working uh, dotting I's, crossing T's, and we're very, very hopeful that we'll be able to come to a conclusion between the two houses uh, in the next few days. It is a very high priority. The public needs to understand that manufacturers have been packaging, and they themselves know they get a package, they unwrap it, and they unwrap it, and they unwrap it, and there's the item. Uh, And then manufacturers have just washed their hands of their responsibility for all of those materials. And it falls upon municipalities and localities to uh, recycle or use it in landfills, which is totally the wrong way to go. So um, I will say to those in the uh, manufacturing and business community, when you say we are moving too quickly, when I started here, uh, the late, great Richard Brodsky was the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee, and he had a sound packaging act. 30 years later, we still need to address that. So, And I intend to ensure that we move forward on that front because it means that manufacturers should bear responsibility for uh, the materials that they're putting out into the public uh, and are not responsible for uh, cleaning up the waste. And it should be a shared responsibility, and they haven't been doing their share. And in terms of dotting the I's and crossing the T's, is is that just reference to negotiations between the Assembly and Senate, or is this a three-way negotiation? Well, at the the moment, we're still uh, talking to each other, uh, but I think we'll have a work product that um, we hope will be uh, embraced by the executive. Would you imagine the legislature taking up a bill on this issue without uh, buy-in from the governor? That's a a big question. What do you do at the end of session? Uh, You take up bills that have three-way agreement. You take up bills that are critical policy initiatives and hope that uh, you can convince the governor. Uh, Or, uh, I've been here a long time, sometimes you make a policy statement. I would like to see us move beyond a policy statement and actually get something done. For the governor, I think... It would be a very important thing for her to show uh, localities that she understands that this burden should not fall solely on uh, municipalities and taxpayers. Well, we've been speaking with Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Deborah Glick. She's a Manhattan Democrat. Assemblymember, thanks so much for making the time. Thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's our pleasure. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.